run an enthusiast single graphics card system on an inexpensive 450 to 500 watt power supply anyways. Now let's dive into performance numbers. Our synthetics, which included CPU Mark, Y Cruncher, Cinebench, and ROG Realbench, showed KB Lake offering improvements of about 5 to 7% across the board, including in single threaded applications, which isn't terrible, but isn't horribly impressive either. And when you compare KB Lake at stock versus our overclocked Skylake chip, which ran within 100 megahertz of each other, the gap becomes smaller, making these improvements an even more minor selling point for enthusiasts who, well, overclock. Gaming performance wasn't much different, as there was no appreciable difference between generations when gaming with a discrete GTX 1080, with KB Lake actually performing slightly worse in some situations. For onboard video aficionados, the integrated HD 630 graphics do show a small improvement over Skylake, but the 1 to 2 extra frames per second don't really make it viable for new AAA titles. Bringing us to the conclusion, these small improvements don't make KB Lake a bad platform. If you liked last year's Madden game, you'll probably like the new one with all the updated player stats and special team jerseys too. They just mean that KB Lake isn't really a sensible upgrade for a Core i7 machine built in the last one to three years. Something that could be a product of the challenges associated with building faster chips on current technology, or could be a product of a complacent Intel that hasn't really had a real competitor in almost a decade. I'm sure the next couple of years will tell us once and for all which one it is. So Tunnel Bear is the simple VPN app that makes it easy to browse privately and enjoy a more open internet. You simply download it. It's so easy. You just go to the page and it like downloads automatically. It's actually kind of amazing. Then what happens is you press the button and you can pick up to 20 different countries to tunnel through. And as soon as you activate that button, boom, your connection gets encrypted and it appears to the websites and services you use online as though you are browsing from a different country. The best part is you don't have to take my word for it. You can try it for free with 500 megs of data and no credit card required. Heading over to tunnelbear.com slash LTT and using our link, you can save 10% if you get an unlimited data plan. All right, guys, if you like this video, like it. If you dislike this video, dislike it. Get subscribed to see more of our content. I'm sure there's going to be a crazy, insane fanboy war down below, so try to keep it as civil as possible. And if you'd like to take it away from the YouTube comments, you can go to the forum. I'm still, I'm, I'm sure that's going to be a war still, but try to keep it civil there as well. Uh, if you want to check out some of our merch, you can see that in the link down below. Also, there's a link to Amazon where you can buy whatever processor your heart desires. And if you want to see another video, check out this one, which is actually not a line of seconds video. This is a channel super fun. CPU innovation is dead. How many of you feel this way? Like every time you upgrade your computer, you're saving 32 cents on your power bill this month and not getting better performance in games, creative applications, or even just general usage. Well, the thing about feelings is that they're difficult to quantify. So we gathered up every top Intel CPU from the last 10 years and put together an epic comparison for you. Performance, power consumption, thermals, and price. Is innovation dead? Is it more than a feeling? G-Fuel is the sugar-free alternative energy beverage that helps you maintain focus and endurance over long days in gaming sessions. Use our code at the link below. Let's start with our testing methodology. We used the same video card on every platform, even though the GTX 1080 wasn't even a twinkle in Jensen's eye when the Pentium Extreme Edition 955 was the king of the hill. 
We did this because we wanted the main variable to be CPU performance rather than allowing this to turn into a comparison of the best overall systems through the years. With that said, DDR memory has gone all the way from 667 megahertz dual channel to over 2000 megahertz quad channel. So our compromise there was to use a high-end RAM and motherboard combination that would have been typical at the time. We went 10 years back and for every year picked out the first Extreme Edition Intel CPU. Then for each one we performed the following tests. Temperature under load, overall system power consumption in our Skybox stair test, and we put it through a suite of modern CPU and gaming benchmarks. Though, since this project already had me tunneling into the dark recesses of my past, I was unable to resist benchmarking each CPU on Half-Life 2 as well. Using such old hardware presented a few challenges, not least of which was we had to use Windows 7 on all of our builds to ensure driver and game support. CPU Mark was the first test, and the results were very boring since they were just numbers on a spreadsheet. But then I had John turn it into a graph. Ha, ah, much better. While the multi-threaded results that use all of the CPU's cores show incremental performance improvements, the hidden story here is the single-threaded results, where we see Intel's current 10-core flagship, the 6950X, getting outperformed like by chips going PTSD. all the way back to 2011. In Y Cruncher, a benchmark that calculates 50 million digits of pi, we tested in multi-threaded mode, which gave us similar results to CPU mark, incremental improvements. Cinebench proved to be interesting, as I initially expected the results would mimic CPU mark, but I was pleasantly surprised. The 6950X sat at the top as king in both multi-threading and single-core tests, with the oldest chip, a Pentium, on the bottom. Lucky dog. On to our first real-world benchmark. Adobe Media Encoder again shows the older X79 chips with their higher single-core clock speeds beating the 6950X in the more commonly used GPU-accelerated rendering method. A video where we went more into this and why it happens can be found here. Each of the game benchmarks seemed to tell the same old story of incremental performance bumps. Rise of the Tomb Raider, our modern game engine representative, managed to scale through all generations, only slowing down when going from 8 to 10 cores. Crisis 3, representing an older AAA engine, improved very little past the i7-965, as it is not a very multi-threaded title. And then there was Half-Life 2, whose numbers don't show us much other than boring old incremental bumps. But here are the results for nostalgia purposes. So yes, for the most part, each chip performed better than its predecessor, but the margin of improvement from chip to chip shows a steady downward trend. Though I'm sure for some of you, this didn't come as much of a surprise. Intel has publicly stated their R&D is less focused on huge increases in processing power for consumer PCs because they want to direct their attention to mobile, data centers, Internet of Things devices, and the cloud. So then, CPU power draw and heat output, which are very important to those markets, that's way down on newer products, right? Only sort of. At idle, power saving features have improved this dramatically. But when working hard, on the high end at least, Intel has settled into a thermal and power budget they're comfortable with, and they seem to be just adding more cores accordingly. So efficiency is up, that is performance per watt, but your power draw while gaming will likely remain mostly unchanged. Let's look at pricing trends now. For an entire decade, a thousand US dollars, give or take, would get you the pinnacle of Intel consumer engineering. Not so anymore. They're asking a whopping $1,700 for their flagship enthusiast product. So, conclusion time then. 
decreasing performance gains and increasing prices. The rational human in me might point at the collapse of Moore's law caused by the cost and difficulty of continuing to shrink silicon transistors and Intel's design goals that have shifted to address growing markets rather than shrinking ones to explain this. But the conspiracy theorist in me noticed three things. One, after 2011, we stopped seeing large single core performance bumps from Extreme Edition chips. And after 2013, we stopped seeing tangible single core improvements in consumer chips at all. Two, the last time AMD had a CPU in competition with Intel for the high-end market was in 2008. And three, perhaps most incriminatingly, the Intel logo looks suspiciously like the eye of a reptile turned on its side. It's time for another Razer giveaway, and today it's all about the Kraken Pro and 7.1 V2 headsets from Razer. Both models include 50 millimeter drivers, lightweight frames, a headband designed for better weight distribution and less clamping force, larger interchangeable ear cushions that are softer and have better sound isolation, fully retractable unidirectional microphones, and the 7.1 features 7.1 virtual surround sound over its USB connection. It's got active noise cancelling and Razer chroma lighting as well. We're giving away five of the pros as well as one 7.1 as part of a six gaming bundle giveaway from Razer. Enter through the link in the video description. So thanks for watching guys. If this video sucked, you know what to do. But if it was awesome, get subscribed, hit that like button, or even consider checking out our affiliate code links to where to buy CPUs at Amazon in the video description. You can also buy a cool shirt like this one from our merch store or join our forum, which is freaking awesome. All that is linked down below. Now that you're done doing all that stuff, you're probably wondering what to watch next. So click that little button in the top right corner to check out our latest through the ages, or not latest, this is the latest, the previous one, where we looked at CPU water blocks. Even if you won't let anything colored green or blue come within 10 feet of your PC, it's hard to deny that the last few years have been a tough time for AMD fans. Aside from very minor incremental updates, we haven't seen any truly new high-end desktop CPUs, and Team Red is still getting handily beaten in the GPU market as well. But hope springs eternal, and it looks like there's going to be plenty for AMD fans to get excited about in 2017. But is it enough? to make AMD competitive, to make them more of a mainstay among PC gamers, and perhaps most importantly, to make them more of that sweet paper that will allow them to continue to innovate in the future. To answer, let's first take a closer look at what AMD is up to on the GPU side of things today. We've seen their focus shift from trying to compete directly against NVIDIA at every segment of the market to competing on value for the money. Their new RX 480, priced at 200 US dollars, was heavily marketed as affordable VR at a lower price point than NVIDIA was willing to offer. This resulted in AMD shipping one and a half million more discrete desktop GPUs in the third quarter of 2016 than they did in the same period in 2015, nearly a 70% increase. But can AMD continue this momentum? Right now, there's nothing current gen on the high end from AMD, but that's set to change very soon with Vega, its next iteration of its North Star themed GPUs, which AMD has already confirmed will be aimed at the high end and enthusiast segments. While they won't be able to undercut NVIDIA on price by very much, seeing as they essentially contract with the same third-party fabs to actually manufacture the chips, offering performance similar to a GTX 1070 or a 1080 at a slightly lower price could help AMD a great deal, especially as it doesn't actually cost the company as much more as you might think to make a higher tier GPU 
than a mid-range or a low-tier one which should improve their profitability. Although Vega GPUs will be using the same GCN 4th generation architecture as the RX 480, they'll be beefed up with nearly twice as many stream processors, which could make the GPU wars very interesting come the first half of next year. But what will the AMD fan pair his or her shiny new Vega GPU with? Well, AMD's new Zen CPU lineup will be released soon, marking a dramatic shift in AMD's CPU philosophy as well. You see, part of the reason AMD lost so much ground in the CPU market over the last five years is that they focused more on core count, meaning that you could buy a six or an eight core AMD chip for fairly cheap, but performance per core has lagged behind Intel often significantly with high power consumption being yet another cross to bear. And since single threaded performance is typically more important for gamers and even in multi-threaded workloads past a certain number of cores as we discovered recently, AMD chips have been a harder sell, especially considering that the AMD desktop platform at least their high-end FX chipsets haven't been updated in so long that they lack native support for USB 3, DDR4, PCI Express 3.0, and NVMe SSDs. And that's ignoring Intel-specific standards that are gaining traction, like Thunderbolt 3. Most of that, though, changes with Zen, as AMD has publicly announced that the focus is squarely on per-core performance along with lower power consumption. And early reports seem to indicate that Zen might be pretty close to Intel's Broadwell family performance-wise. And while Broadwell is a couple of generations old at this point, keep in mind that Intel's single-threaded improvements from Broadwell to the current generation Kaby Lake have been quite minimal, as the focus for Intel has been more on improving the platform overall, including graphics performance. So the vast majority of users might be hard-pressed to notice too much of a difference between a red computer and a blue one. So with that in mind, AMD pricing the chips correctly could mean users might choose Zen instead of paying the Intel tax for a performance boost they might not notice or Intel exclusive technologies like Thunderbolt. But of course, AMD isn't just a mainstay in desktop PCs. How are things looking for their laptop and console endeavors? Well, the good news for AMD is that not only did their sales of laptop GPUs grow in 2016, but AMD GPUs were also included in all 15-inch models of the new Apple MacBook Pro, which is flying off the shelves for some reason. Of course, a small kick in the teeth is that AMD is no longer the only player in the console graphics market, with Nintendo switching from a custom AMD chip to an NVIDIA SoC for its new Switch hybrid console. Back to the original question, though. While AMD has some obvious hurdles to clear, 2017 looks like it's going to be a very exciting year if you're all about hashtag better red. Just don't get all political if you have to call Amazon support when you ship it is late. If you're not a member of Dollar Shave Club yet, join today and you'll get your first month of razors for free. You get like a sparkly sound effect? Free! Dollar Shave Club delivers amazing razors directly to your door and membership means that you can afford to shave with a fresh blade anytime you want and you don't have to get off your butt, go fight with someone to go get the key and open up the stupid thing to bring out the razors to keep them behind locked cages for crying out loud. And the reason they do it is because they're so expensive, but they don't have to be if you go with Dollar Shave Club. And they've got other great bathroom supplies as well, like their Dr. Carver Shave Butter, as well as their Aftershave and their Peppermint Scented Butt Wipes for Men, their One Wipe Charlies. Dollar Shave Club is available in the US, Canada, and Australia, so if you live in one of those places, what are you waiting for? Head over to dollarshaveclub.com slash Linus and give them a try for free. So thanks for watching, guys. Like if you liked, dislike if you disliked, check out our other channels, leave a comment with video suggestions, and subscribe! 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 Woo! If you haven't already, subscribe! Whatever you want. Sleepy. They never expect that.
AMD brought us to the suite here at CES 2017 to prove once and for all that Ryzen is real. It is physical, it is tangible. You can touch it, but you can't touch it. But, but, but I could touch it because I'm here if I, as long as I didn't care about like ESD shocking it because these floors are carpeted. Not only do they have the couple of systems that I'm gonna show you here, but they actually have systems from over a dozen of their partners. Everyone from PC case gear to what the devil is this thing? Whatever it is, it's water cooled, it's red, it looks actually pretty freaking bananas and the logo's in Chinese. So I'm not gonna try too hard to pronounce that one anyway. Hard review, which is which, uh, how to enable. What's up, ladies and gentlemen of YouTube? Boogie2988 coming at you live once again through the power of the internet. And it's here, it's over, it finally happened. Uh, the Nintendo Switch reveal presentation just wrapped up, and I've got some good stuff to say. And I got some bad stuff to say, but let's start off with the informative stuff first. So after the presentation, we definitely know the launch price. Here in the United States, it'll be two ninety nine. It's a two hundred ninety nine yen in Japan, and it's probably going to be somewhat so close to the equivalent to of that in the majority of places that it's going to launch. And it will launch simultaneously on March third in the majority of the places it'll be sold at. It looks like they are already taking pre-orders in some places, and as usual, follow the rule. Pre-order hardware because you can always return or even sell at a profit the hardware. Never pre-order software because you can't return it if it sucks. They said during the presentation that the battery life should be between two and a half hours to six hours depending on the game that you're playing. So statistically speaking, expect two and a half, maybe three hours of gameplay from most of the games you play. It looks like you can charge and play when it's inside the dock. Uh, you can also charge and play it with it in your hands as long as you plug in with the included AC adapter. So that's good. Uh, the base set seems to only come with the device, everything you need to power it, everything you need to hook it up, the docking station, and of course two Joy-Con controllers. Though there is an optional bundle that costs exactly the same, that has two colored Joy-Con uh, controllers rather than just the standard black. Unfortunately, there were no confirmed technical specs. Uh, there was no telling about SD cards or the size of SD cards it could use. They didn't tell you what the internal memory on it was like. You didn't get to learn about processor speed or, or the definition of the screen or what it puts out when it's putting out the television. They basically ignored that completely but I think with tomorrow's event in New York there's going to be continuing information leaking out so follow me on social media I'll talk about it as I learn that stuff there and now for the really good stuff I think the price point is fine I love the launch date I'm excited to get a hold of it uh, there are a handful of games that they showed that make me excited obviously Splatoon 2 looks absolutely fantastic I just want more Splatoon and if I can play Splatoon on the go I'm going to be very happy about that new arenas new costumes new weapons then they showed a uh, 3d Mario game that looks like to me about as exciting uh, for this launch as the n64 title was for that launch I mean I'm this game blew me away this is exactly the 3d Mario title I wanted it showed him jumping in some beautiful landscapes the graphics looked amazing the physics looked really really good it even showed him jumping around on cars off of cars into light posts and stuff in downtown New York I don't know what all that's about but I can't wait to find out unfortunately that's not a launch title and I think that's terrible that it's not a launch title because it won't be out until fall of that year. I think that should have been the launch title. I wish that had come bundled with the system or with some system. Not going to be the case. Then they did confirm that Legend of Zelda will drop on March the 3rd. And this is both a good and a bad thing. Number one, it's coming out for the Wii U at the same time, at least unless they've canceled that. I don't think that they have. So the people that own a Wii U will probably still play it there. Um, that way you don't have to rush out and buy a Switch. I will try to get the Switch that day and try to play it on the system. Um, but I worry that that game is not as complete as it could be. I really, really worry about that because it's such a big project and it was such a short development time. It feels like uh, I hope the game is as good and complete as it possibly can be on March the 3rd. But that is pretty much the only launch title that looks even remotely interesting to me based on this small one-hour presentation. I will have to admit, though, the, the Zelda trailer they showed at the end of the presentation. I, I cried. Then, of course, one of the reasons the Wii U got trounced is because it didn't have third-party support 
and obviously the technical specs. We still don't know the technical specs here, but third-party support seems to be coming along. They had several people from several different companies, some who seem to be begr begrudgingly participating, uh, like the folks over at Sega. But uh, there was a good number of third-party titles being uh, introduced, like obviously Skyrim, which was shown in the initial commercial. And for whatever reason, Todd Howard and Bethesda decided to gaslight and say that it wasn't on the system. Well, it's finally confirmed. Uh, there are a few other games like Project Octopath, which just looks really weird to me. Um, and even like EA is putting FIFA on the system. And I know that's not going to mean a lot to Nintendo's core audience, but the people who love FIFA might love finally being able to play FIFA on the go. If you look at some of the little outro movies they did where they show like compilations of different video games that might be on the system or going to be on the system, you can pick out a lot of different titles and a lot of different franchises that you'll be excited to see, like Tetris and Sonic and Bomberman and stuff like that. There are a lot of different games that are showing up in the little montage. They did not spend near enough time talking about the game specifically the launch games to get people like me excited they did actually waste quite a bit of their time on something that i kind of hated nintendo really nintendo this one it's so bizarre to me how how disconnected they can be from gamers uh, because they showed off all of this weird stuff that the system can do. How the Joy-Con controller can use HD haptic feedback to provide the, the, the feel of a drink and ice cubes being inside of it. I, why? They spent a very large portion of their time showing off a game called 1-2 Switch, which is some sort of reaction-based game and where you use the little Joy-Con controllers to do whatever. They showed another...